Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. When Jesus and his disciples came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked them the question, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they began to answer. They replied, Some say you're John the Baptist, apparently believing John the Baptist had risen from the dead. Some Elijah, maybe meaning the Elijah who was prophesied to come. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said, But who do you say that I am? You, my disciples. Who do you think I am? And Peter spoke up, no doubt speaking for the disciples as a whole. And he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now what do you think was in Simon Peter's mind at the time he spoke those words? Toward the end of John's Gospel, John tells his, his readers why he has written of the signs Jesus performed. In John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, he says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So you read through the Gospel of John, you see all kinds of signs, but he says, well, there are a lot more. There are a lot more. They're not written. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Again, what did that mean? What did that mean to the first century Jewish mind? These terms, Christ and Son of God. Mark begins his gospel with these words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So those two titles there, Christ and Son of God, of course we know that they're deeply meaningful. We rest our faith on them, in fact the meaning of those terms. But what do you think those meant to the first century Jewish person who was looking for the coming of Messiah? Well, from just these few words from three of the four Gospels, it is obvious that they all wanted to get across the message that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. In fact, that was central to their message. But again, what did these titles, Christ and Son of God, mean to the Jews who lived during the time of Jesus and the apostles? When they started preaching that He's the Christ, He's the Son of God, what came across? Even in His ministry, that message went out. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. What was in their minds? Well, to answer that, and also we're going to go beyond that answer, we're going to also ask today, what about their experience of the Christ, their experience, the Christ event, what effect did it have on their concept and their understanding and their development of these titles, Christ and Son of God? Because I would say for sure, in fact, I know as a fact, that the experience of Christ, the Christ event, when I say Christ event, what I mean is His life, His ministry, His teachings, His death, His resurrection, his post-resurrection appearances, his ascension, and you can include the coming of the Holy Spirit in that. This is the Christ event. What effect did the Christ event have on the disciples' understandings of these terms, Christ and Son of God? If you want a title to the sermon today, it is Son of God. Let's begin, our, let, let's begin with their own scriptures, the Jewish people of that day. Let's begin with their own scriptures that part of the Bible that we call the Old Testament. If you turn back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, we begin right away to get a picture of what they would have had in mind when they heard of this message that Messiah had come. Remember, Messiah and Christ, those two words have the same meaning. In chapter 16, in the previous chapters, I might add that we've been reading about Saul, or you, if you read them, you will read about Saul, King Saul, and the problems associated with his uh, uh, kingship. And then uh, Samuel, of course, is very distressed over how things have worked out with Saul. Chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Now note this, Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Of course, Samuel was concerned that if Saul found out, he would kill him, but he sends him on anyway. And when he gets there, he has Jesse the Bethlehemite to bring out his sons. So he has seven of them there. 
all obviously very fine looking young men. They look like leaders, as we would say in the modern vernacular or the way we would describe it. It looks very presidential. You know. So these, these, these guys, look, some, at least some of them, looked like leaders. One of them stepped before uh, Samuel, you know, and God is going to reveal his choice. And the first one steps before Samuel, and Samuel thinks, surely the Lord's anointed, keep that term in mind, is before me. And God tells him, said, no, no, that's not him. You know, one after the other. And they all look very much like, well, I suppose all of them, at least some of them look very much like leaders. And, and God tells Samuel, said, look, Samuel, don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. And that's what my decision is going to be based on. So all seven pass before him, and not a one of them is the one that God has chosen. And so Samuel says, anybody else? And Jesse says, yeah, well, there's a shepherd, the, other, the last of the sons. So bring, him, bring him here. And so he brings him, and it's David, of course. And let's take up the account there. Verse 12, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Here you have Samuel anointing David. What does that mean? He took this oil, he poured it on his head. What does that mean? It means he was consecrated for a particular purpose before God, for a divine mission, a divine purpose. In this case, he was consecrated to be the king over Israel. What is the term that's used here? You know the term in Hebrew is Mashiach. That's where we get the word Messiah. In the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation, the term is Christos. It's where we get the word Christ. And here we find the verb form is Mashiach or Christos. That's what Samuel did to David. He poured the oil on him thus consecrating him before God for this office of king. And therefore David then was the, this is the noun form, the Mashiach, the Christos. David was the Christ. And it's very interesting here it says the spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day forward. So you have associated with this, this being made Christos, this anointing, you have associated with it the descent of the Spirit upon the person who is anointed. For what purpose? Well, he's consecrated. He's consecrated, set apart for a special purpose, in this case, a special office. And the Spirit, of course, would then empower him to carry out the duties associated with that office. So there you have the beginning. This is the foundation of where we will eventually get in understanding what is the meaning of the word Christ, and as we shall see, the expression, the title, Son of God. Well, let's continue the account in uh, 2 Samuel, go over to 2 Samuel, pass over a lot of history, and get to the place where the covenant, God makes a covenant with David. And we will break into the account in verse 12 and read some of what God said to David. In 2 Samuel chapter, let's get over there and get in the right chapter here. 2 chapter, Samuel chapter 7, let's start in verse 12. Verse 12, God says to David, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. That's your offspring. In this case, it would be his son Solomon. Who will come from your body, that means he's going to be your natural son, not an adopted son. He will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. David wanted to build the house, that's the temple. But he says Solomon will build the house for God's name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom for a couple of days. You, did you catch that? <laughs> Forever. Forever. Now he just, we still remember Saul very well. His kingdom didn't last very long at all, did it? 
But God makes a covenant with David. He says it's going to be different now. I'm going to set up your son as your successor. He's going to be the new Christ, the new anointed one. And I'm going to establish his kingdom forever. You can take that to mean age, age lasting, everlasting. What it means, it's an enduring kingdom. You don't have to get into the technicalities of word meanings to understand that. Now get this, verse 14, very important. I will be his father. Talking about Solomon. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Did you know that Solomon was the Christ, the son of God? Yeah. So was David. He will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul. In other words, this is going to be different now. This is going to be an enduring kingship and kingdom. Whom I remove from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. The throne of David, the throne upon which Solomon sat, is established forever. According to all these words and according to all the, this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So here you have David anointed. He is the Christ. Here his, the, he, he passes on the heir of his throne. By God's selection is Solomon. And we read later, we won't take the time to go there, but Solomon is, was anointed. He became the new Christos, Mashiach, Christ, if you will, Messiah, the Son of God. So now are you beginning to get in your mind what the Jews of Jesus' day must have had in mind when they heard expressions like that? Well, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one we've been awaiting. In other words, he is, that, he is of that line of David and rightfully may take the throne of his father David and once again rule over Israel in a restored kingdom. That, no doubt, is what they had in mind. <coughs> now, with, with these things that we're reading here, you know, we often begin at the end of the story and read back into it. That's okay. That's okay. But trying to get our, ourselves into the minds of the first century Jewish reader or people before that, you know, Psalm 2, the second Psalm, makes all kinds of sense now. I mean, it makes sense before. It made sense before. But now then you begin to get into it from their perspective. Let's read some of that, or if not all of it. It starts out, Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Now, who would that be? Nobody had a question as to who that was. Everybody who read that psalm and the one who wrote it knew exactly who the Lord's anointed was. It was David or David's successor. David, Solomon, or someone in the line of David. It is the Lord's anointed. The Lord and His Christ. So they take counsel. The kings, and that's what the kings of the earth did. They took counsel against Yahweh, the God of Israel, and against His anointed one, His Christ. Christos, Mashiach, the king. Let us, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords for us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord, that's Yahweh, shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress from in his depth displeasure. Yet I have set, now get this, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You think whoever wrote this, whether it was David or someone else, they didn't know who that king was? No, you see, this is, this is commentary on the promise, the covenant God made with David. The king is the Davidic king. This is God's king. And that throne is established by God himself. So in that sense, it's God's throne. He says, I will delight in the decree. In the, decree. the Lord has said to me, you are my son. That's what he said concerning Solomon, isn't it? This, again, this is the Davidic king. Today I have begotten you. 
Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. You know, the inheritance pertain to the land. He's saying here, look, I'll give you more than that. I'll expand the borders. I'll expand the boundaries of your kingdom. The nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss or honor the Son. That's the Davidic king. Honor him because that's God's anointed. Lest he be angry <clears throat> and you and perish in the way when his wrath is kindled a little. So you get the picture here that God has established a kingdom and has placed upon the throne of that kingdom, first of all, David. That's his anointed one, his Christos, his Mashiach, Messiah or Christ. And he has successors, Solomon, his son, being the first. And then there are other successors. So here we have the kingdom of God upon this earth. It is the theocratic kingdom of Israel with the Davidic king, the Christ, the Son of God, upon the everlasting throne, which is a throne established by Yahweh himself. That's what we're reading here. But when we look back at the history of this kingdom and its li line of anointed kings, we see all kinds of problems, don't we? The kingdom split. The northern kingdom was overthrown and taken into captivity. The southern kingdom, same thing, exiled. And we find many prophecies regarding all of those things. The captivity, as well as promises of a restoration. Restoration of the kingdom and the coming, and in, and in all of those restoration, or for so many of those restoration promises and prophecies, what you find is a prophecy about the coming of a new king. In other words, David's dynasty hasn't crumbled. It's not over. A new king will be placed upon the throne over restored Israel. That's the message that comes across in the prophets. You see it. You see that theme running throughout. So he will take his place, on his rightful place, on the throne of his father David. Now, during the Roman period, which is the time when Jesus came, many Jews were hoping and expecting the coming of this new king that they knew about from their own scriptures, the new Christos, the Son of God. And I think now, when we look back at those texts, we can get a, a kind of a feel for what they had in mind exactly what they had in mind. With this in mind, all of this in mind, let's return now to Mark's Gospel, which I mentioned earlier. Mark's Gospel, I'm going to begin to do some comparisons here. Again, let's go to Mark chapter 1, as I referred to a little while ago. Mark 1, verse 1, Mark says, the beginning of the Gospel, or good news, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Those terms are meaningful, aren't they? And they would have been meaningful to the people who first heard them. And then John goes, or Mark, I should say, goes right into the story of John the Baptist. The prophecies about uh, the one who's to prepare the way before, you know, the herald, which is John the Baptist. And then he talks about John's ministry, and he's finished with that by verse 8. Just a real short section. Just, just one little blurb, you know, one little subsection for that, for the... The thing about John, the section on John's ministry. And then right away, verse 8, I mean, he gets right to it now. Right away in verse 8, it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, that's a condensed story if there ever was one. You know, you read this and you think, Okay, where is the Annunciation of Gabriel? Where is the story of the Virgin? conceiving, where's all the things that Gabriel told Mary, uh, where's the story of the wise men, where's the story of the shepherds, where's the story of the flight into Egypt and later the return, where is all this? Well, Mark skips right over it, doesn't he? 
because that's not his intent. His, not, his intent is not to give an exhaustive discussion on or a history of uh, the life of Jesus. He wants to get right to it, to show the miracles and teachings of Jesus, to show the good news, as he says in the beginning, the good news of Jesus Christ, or the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not only the good news about him, but also the good news that he brought. So, he gets right to it here. And none of this, uh, the other things. And then he goes on, he goes on, it says, uh, and immediately, verse 10, immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Does that, is that reminiscent of something? We just read it a little while ago. When David was anointed, the Spirit of Yahweh descended upon him. So here we see this happening to Jesus. There's an obvious connection here, isn't there? This is an announcement. It's in, in visible form. The Spirit comes visibly. And this is obviously, a, there's a message there. This is the one. This is the anointed one. The Christos, the Christ. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, Son of God. Now, Son of God takes on a little deeper meaning here, I would say. Don't, wouldn't you think? You know, you wouldn't necessarily see it, though, on the surface of Mark's Gospel. It goes right hand in hand with what you see in the Old Testament. In fact, if you only had these few verses in Mark's Gospel, you might think, you might get the impression that Mark was an adoptionist, that Jesus was the adopted Son of God. You know, that, there, that's an ancient heresy. There were some people uh, in ancient times who believed that Jesus was the Son of God because he was adopted. When did the adoption occur? When the Spirit came upon him. So you might get the impression just from this that Mark wasn't an adoptionist. Let me say that before we go any further. But you might get the impression that that's, that was his Christology. You, don't have, you just don't have very much more than that other than the fact he calls him Son of God. Now then, with that in mind, I'd like to go on to another gospel. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, and see if the Christology develops a little bit. See if it deepens a little bit here. Christology meaning the study of Christ, the, the doctrine of Christ. To see if it deepens here uh, with Matthew's gospel. In chapter 1, and we'll break into the account here in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. I would say the Christology is elevated a little bit here, wouldn't you? You don't get that in Mark. At least he doesn't describe it for us in these details. It said, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her public, a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, kind of establishes the genealogy here, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now then, we're beginning to see a deeper meaning to the title, Son of God, aren't we? Remember, Solomon was a son of God, and yet we, we read there right in the very text that declared him to be the son of God, we read that he would come from the body of David, meaning he had, a human parent, he had human parents, a father and a mother. And she will bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, that's a new concept, save them from their sins. That adds something to the story, doesn't it? It deepens our understanding of Christ, the Son of God. Not only will he rescue Israel from the enemy, that's what they were looking for. Not only will he establish this theocratic kingdom, that's what they were looking for. But he's going to rescue the people from their sins. I never read that about Solomon or David or any of the Davidic kings. So we see... Our understanding of Christ, the Son of God, deepens at this point, doesn't it? 
You might say the Christology gets a little bit higher. You know, scholars talk about high Christology and low Christology. What that means is, uh, well, for example, a low Christology would be, uh, you've, you've heard, you've seen so many books that have come out on the historical Jesus. Everybody's trying to discover the historical Jesus. The one described in the Gospels is not quite good enough, so it's the historical Jesus. We want to get under the, under the myths of the Gospel and find the real man that existed back then. Who were his parents? Who were they really? And all this kind of thing. A higher Christo high Christology, and the higher your Christology, then the more you connect him, Jesus, with God. So you have a high Christology and low Christology. So this is quite a high Christology here. Now let's go to Luke. Luke. Matthew does pretty well, but Luke provides more details. In Luke chapter 1, again, breaking, uh, passing over a lot of material and, and going right to the section we want, Gabriel, Gabriel has announced what will happen. He's conversing with Mary. He says, verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him, what? The throne of his father David. It's clear what we're talking about here, isn't it? The same throne that was promised to David as an everlasting throne and to David's successors. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, Now this, this is a really high Christology here. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. You get that? Why is He the Son of God? Why is He called the Son of God? Because He doesn't have a human father. Solomon did. So you see the understanding of the title Son of God deepens very much so. Now indeed Elizabeth, well it goes on to tell about Elizabeth and so on, I won't go into that. So here you have this, this uh, high Christology here. The link with God is so clear. He's the Son of God, not by adoption, not by adoption, but He really is God's Son. He has no human father. That gives a whole new meaning to the title Son of God. Can you get any higher than that, as far as Christology is concerned? Can you get any higher? Well, you, you might think, well, no, how can you get higher than that? Well, you can go to the Gospel of John and you see he managed to do it. He did it. Go to John 1. This is really a high Christology. It's the highest. John 1 doesn't simply connect him with the, the, uh, mir the miraculous conception. He connects him with creation. Now that is a high Christology. In John 1, we're all familiar with this, very much familiar with it. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The way it's structured in the Greek is uh, God was the Word. That's why some scholars prefer the translation, what God was, the Word was. Perhaps that's the reason. But it means the same thing. The Word was God doesn't mean the Word was other than God. Some people make the argument that the Word was other than God, but here, here you can't make that argument on the basis of, of what John is saying here. It says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness. Well, first of all, in Him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So he uses this theme of word and light. Where do you suppose he's getting this? He's actually drawing from the creation narrative and applying this to Christ. 
So let's go back there. Hold your place here. Let's go back to Genesis 1, and I'll show you how, what he's doing with this. In Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. What do you need when you have darkness? You need light. You need light. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Now I want you to notice two things here. God said. What does that mean? His word went out. His word went forth. And what happened? Light. John has adapted that for his use to describe a relationship that existed before the world was. So he connects Christ with creation itself. And over and over here you read about how God said, and God said, and when God said, it was done. In other words, his word went forth, and what, was, what his word said was accomplished. So in this way, you understand, all things, God created all things through his word. Now, again, John is using that, the creation narrative. Also, you find similar language in the Psalms and other places where the word goes forth from God, the word creates. And even in some of the Hebrew literature, which you find the, the word leaping out of heaven and doing God's will on the earth. And so John is using these descriptions to describe a relationship that existed before the world was. Now what does this have to do with the title Son of God? Well, you think about it for a moment, you realize Father and Son describes a relationship, doesn't it? So does God and Word. God sends forth His Word. But John is very clear. The Word is not other than God. Now, you can understand that by understanding two words. Substance or essence, if you will. Take your choice. Or nature, that one will work too. And person. There's one essence. There's one, one divinity, one deity, but here you have two persons. A good analogy for that, and understand this is an analogy. All analogies, anytime you, you, you take, create an analogy, take physical things to describe God, it is going to break down at some point. It's not going to be perfect. So just understand the main point I'm getting at here. God made one humanity, only one. He named it humanity. Adam, or Dom in the Hebrew. Only the one humanity, one substance. And out of that one substance, he formed a second person. So we're talking a relationship here now, aren't we? One substance, one humanity, two persons now. And you can use that to kind of understand you have one God, one essence, and yet you have two persons. The analogy breaks down at a certain point, but I think it helps you get the point. Now, there is a relationship here then, and you find other terms that are used in regards to this relationship. Not only here we find the word logos, or word, we also see elsewhere wisdom, image, and of course we see the word that we've been looking at today, son. All of these things describe a relationship, don't they? And so what I'm saying here is that, and I believe what John is telling us here, is there was, that, that the, what happened in time and in history when the virgin conceived and gave birth to the Son of God, what happened in history is a reflection of an, a relationship that existed before the world was. That's what he's telling us. Now, you want a high Christology, doesn't go any higher than that. So John begins and gives deeper meaning to these titles and what it means to be the Christ, the Son of God, far more so than the Jews of those day would have at first comprehended. But you know, the Christ event came, when the Christ came, when all of those things occurred, here was a man who came on the scene. He did works like no one else had ever done. 
It was obvious that God was with him. And not only did he do these mighty works, not only did he raise the dead and cast out demons and heal all kinds of diseases, but he predicted his own death. Now, you know, a person can do that, and that can be a self-fulfilling thing called suicide. But he, not only did he predict his death, he also predicted his resurrection, and it happened. Think that didn't have a profound effect on the people who witnessed it? Oh, absolutely. That's one not, it, no, not everybody can pull that one off. <laughs> no, that had an, a powerful effect. And then, of course, the ascension occurred, the coming of the Holy Spirit, but the post-resurrection teachings of Christ. So all of these things, as they came together, enlightened and, and deepened the understanding of the apostles. And so by the time John wrote, I think before he wrote, you see evidence of it in the other Gospels, also in, other, uh, in the epistles, the understanding was that the Christ, the Son of God, was more than just the human descendant of David. He was, in fact, the Savior, not only of Israel, the Savior of the world. Not only did he come to bring healing, not only did he come to re regather Israel at some point in history, he came to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And now I think with the New Testament complete, the revelation of God here in our hands, we can see very clearly the true and deep meaning of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God.